Shabbat Shalom, and Chag Sameach. I have to admit that for a long time, I have had a chip on my shoulder about Hanukkah. Don't get me wrong, I actually love celebrating the holiday, lighting the Hanukkiah, singing every song I can think of, eating latkes and sufganiyot, of course, and eight days of gifts. What could I possibly complain about? Well, it's that last item that is the reason for my ajita. It's not that I'm against giving and receiving gifts at all. On the contrary, my frustration comes from the fact that exchanging gifts is not a traditional practice on Hanukkah. We have other occasions in the Jewish calendar for gift giving namely Pesach and Purim. Hanukkah has become a gift-giving holiday because of its proximity to Christmas. And this is a phenomenon that, as an individual, I find tricky to navigate, and as a Jewish educator and rabbi, essential to discuss. Last week, Rabbi Hirsch lamented that Hanukkah is often perceived as the Jewish Christmas and suggested that Hanukkah really is a celebration of Jews asserting their Jewishness in defiance of a world that is overwhelmingly non-Jewish and maybe even anti-Jewish. In the time of the Maccabees, they maintained their Judaism in defiance of Hellenism. Today, it is American society, secular but built on the foundation of Christianity, that some perceive as a threat to Judaism. It's true, Hanukkah is a story of Jews struggling to remain Jews in a Gentile world. But I see this struggle as more internal than external. Yes, the supposedly historical version of Hanukkah is instigated in the second century BCE by a Greek tyrant who sought to stamp out Jewish particularism, and in his character we find a convenient foe to defy. But the more complex truth is that Jews had already begun to Hellenize in earnest generations before Antiochus IV. Greek language and Greek philosophy all permeated the Jewish world outside of Judea and within. Greek art forms and motifs were installed in synagogues. When a gymnasium, the quintessential institution of Greek society, was established in Jerusalem, the high priest himself presided. Even some of the Maccabees themselves had Greek names. The story of Hanukkah is not so simple as us versus them. It is not a story of the struggle to be Jews or not, but of how to be Jews. How to exist in the wider world in a way that is authentic to Jewish traditions and beliefs without isolating ourselves. This question animated Jewish life long before and in the time of the Maccabees, and it has continued to do so to this very day. When we take this question of how to be Jewish in the world, not as a threat to our existence, but as an opportunity to plumb the depths of our tradition and our creativity, Judaism not only survives, it thrives. History is replete with examples of Jews and Judaism adapting and growing to our own benefit and beyond. In ancient times, our people lived in a world of many lands with many gods. When one traveled to another place, they paid homage to the god of that realm. When people were conquered and exiled, they took up the gods of their new lands. Not so for our people. When our temple was destroyed and Jerusalem laid waste, we were exiled from our land and brought to Babylon, but we did not give up our God. We brought God with us into exile. The book of Ezekiel opens with the prophet affirming this move. 
He says, Va'ani betoch hagola. When I was in the community of exiles by the Kfar Canal in Babylon, niftechu hashamayim be'ere marot Elohim. The heavens opened up and I saw visions of God. The radical nature of this move cannot be understated. Even our own Torah doesn't go this far towards true monotheism. After all, the first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. It does not say there are no other gods. With the temple destroyed and the old ways shattered, the survival of Judaism was by no means a foregone conclusion. We mourned the loss and asked, how can we sing a song of Adonai in a strange land? But this was not the final word. Under nearly impossible circumstances, we adapted. We held on to Judaism not with rigid fists, but with soft hands. It didn't change the fact that we were exiled. But in exile, God was with us. Countless times in history we have been met with circumstances that challenged our survival. But it is in those moments when we responded with animation, not despair, that Judaism was enriched and enlivened. Hellenism did not exist in opposition to Judaism. In fact, it expanded our vocabulary and led to the great exegetical work of Philo. Inspired by Platonic and Pythagorean thought, Philo used his Greek education to sacred purpose, interpreting the Torah with a philosophical and allegorical approach that paved the way for rabbinic interpretation that we find in the Midrash and the Talmud, in the works of Maimonides and beyond. In medieval Spain, Arabic poetry gave new form to Jewish expression. And rather than abandoning Judaism for the arguably greener pastures of the golden age of Islam, poets like Yehuda Halevi employed Arabic meter to write the quintessential Jewish expression of longing for Zion. Libi ba Mizrach va'ani besof ma'arav. My heart is in the east and I in the uttermost west. These are but a few instances that illustrate that when met with challenges to our Judaism, we reap great reward from seeing the opportunities within a challenge rather than taking a hostile or defensive stance. One more pertinent example. Reform Judaism itself was born of this question, how to be a Jew in the world. Some feared that the lure of the secular world was too great and that Jews would be unable to remain Jews if they did not keep things exactly as they were. The pioneers of what became Reform Judaism saw this challenge and they were energized by it. They found within it the possibility to shake the dust off of Judaism, to heed the call of our Rosh Hashanah liturgy, Uru Yeshenim Mishnatchem, Benirdamim Hakitsu Mitardematchem. Awake, you sleepers, from your sleep. Rouse yourself, you slumberers, from your slumber. What resulted is a Judaism teeming with life, both ancient and modern. Reform Judaism embodies the spirit of the prophets who sought to refocus Judaism on the core values of our tradition, justice, righteousness, presence, compassion. Reform Judaism exemplifies the rabbinic mode of interrogating our assumptions about tradition and creating a Judaism that can be found not only in our imaginations, but in our own lives. It may seem that we've gone far afield from the topic of Hanukkah, but I see a clear and luminous line through each of these moments in the lives of our people, from exile to the Maccabees to Andalusia to the 19th century, 
moments of inspiration. And so, as much as I love the fuzzy socks and the Hanukkah gelt, and I do, this is the greatest gift of Hanukkah, that it prompts us, that it demands us to ask, how can I be a Jew? When the Maccabees entered the desecrated temple and re-consecrated it, they sang songs of praise and gratitude to the source of life and blessing, and Hanukkah was declared an observance for all time. Why, our texts ask? Why for all time? It was fixed when they sang these words of Hallel. From a narrow place I called out to God, who answered me from a divine expanse. Let us then accept the invitation of Hanukkah to respond to challenges not as forces that restrain us, but as opportunities that expand us. Let us, like our people have done through the ages, come out from our narrow places into broad spaces. Hanukkah Sameach.